Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoyed this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, my name is Brian Benish uh, with CSIAC. I'm happy to have Rick with us here to be presenting today. Um, just a couple words of introduction before I go ahead and hand the, the mic over to Rick. Uh, the webinar, the way we're going to conduct it today is Rick's going to give his presentation. And um, instead of holding questions till the end, we're going to ask that um, if you have any questions you'd like to pose to him during the presentation, you can do that in real time using the Q&A portion of the platform. So if you were in the WebEx platform, you should be able to find um, the, the Q&A section. You might have to click through, uh, the ellipses or three dots, maybe in the bottom of the screen, find Q&A, and you can get your question in the queue that way. Um, it, if you really can't find it and you, you throw it into the chat, that's okay. Between Rick and myself, we'll, we'll monitor those and, and make sure your, your question is, uh, is answered when it's posed. Um, if you have any questions um, or any technical challenges along the way, rest assured we are recording this. We'll make that available after the fact if uh, for you to rewatch later if you do experience any issues. Um, and for more information about CSI, as was covered in that little intro video, um, please check out the website, learn more about who we are, what we do, and how we can help. So um, without much more delay and we introduce Rick. So Rick Aldrich, he is a senior cybersecurity policy advisor for CSIAC. He's also a lead associate with Booz Allen Hamilton supporting the uh, US Office of Department Office of the DOD's Chief Information Officer and the Defense Security Cooperation Agency's Institute for Security Governance. He had previously spent over 15 years uh, as an Air Force judge advocate uh, advocate specializing in cybercrime and information operations portfolios. He's recognized as an outstanding professor of law at the Air Force Academy and has been awarded several grants by the Institute for National Security Studies to research the legal and policy implications of cybercrime and cyber war. He has multiple publications, including a chapter on information and warfare in a widely used textbook, and he's presented at national and international conferences and is a co-author of the DOD's award-winning cyber law digital training product. He's got a BS in computer science from the Air Force Academy, a JD from UCLA, and an LLM in intellectual property law from the University of Houston. And so, Rick, the mic, the floor is yours. You can take it away from here. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much for that kind of introduction. Um, although I am an attorney, I just want to uh, warn you that this presentation cannot be considered legal advice. That gets me into all sorts of trouble. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to make you more aware of the potential legal issues that you may encounter in your work. Um, but when you do recognize those issues, please bring them to your local judge advocate or your local um, agency counsel or your corporate counsel, depending on who you work for, um, and present the issue to them because um, slight variations in facts can, can change the advice. And I just wanna make sure that people are more aware of the situation so they know when to ask for legal advice 
I'm not trying to provide that legal advice here. Um, we do have a packed agenda today, and I like to keep it pretty interactive. It is a little bit more difficult in this um, remote setting. So what I'm going to do is um, when I ask certain questions, instead of polling, which can take a little bit of time, we're just going to do a hand raise. So the first question I'm going to ask before we get started is, um, I just want to mention that my office also assists in preparing the DOD cybersecurity policy chart, which is a chart of about 200 different policies with hyperlinks to the authoritative sources. So just quick to make sure you know where to find it. How many have seen that policy chart? Raise your hand. Okay. And I can't see any hand raises, so maybe it's hard to see them on this side. I don't know. Um, okay, very good. We'll assume that somebody's seeing them somewhere. <laughs> yeah, if, um, you, okay. if, you, if you click the list of attendees, you can see them on. I'm seeing them all come through. Uh, okay, okay, very good. Okay. All good. Okay, that's how it's done. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about some recent Supreme Court cases, um, important bills, new strategies, and significant recent cases. For those of you who have seen this, um, my presentations in the past, they do change regularly. So even if you've seen it in the past, this is going to be different today. Um, even my most recent presentation um, about three months ago, there have been two Supreme Court cases and a, an appellate court case decided since then, which have changed the presentation quite dramatically. So, um, and there's also even been some uh, new bills um, in, uh, that have been advanced as well. So all new material. Um, so I, I hope everyone enjoys it. Let's let's get right into it. The first case I'd like to start with is two cases that came before the Supreme Court this term and were just recently decided um, in June, um, and they involved a similar fact pattern for both cases. The facts were basically this. Um, a woman who was on an exchange program was in Paris, and she ended up going to a nightclub, and while at that nightclub, um, there was an ISIS terrorist attack, and she ended up dying during the attack. Um, her relatives in the United States were obviously very distraught by this outcome, and so they sued both Twitter and, um, uh, and Google. They sued Google on the basis of the fact that Google had YouTube videos that included um, some videos from ISIS um, terrorists, um, and they sued Twitter because Twitter had been used as kind of a training ground and a recruiting ground for ISIS terrorists. So the reason I just wanted to bring these to your attention is because these two cases combined were identified in the press as the cases that could change the internet forever or the, ch the cases that could undermine the internet forever. And the reason for that is they both somewhat revolved around Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. What that act said long ago, right at the time the, the internet was just kind of uh, being uh, stood up, um, is that uh, service providers could not be held liable for the content of uh, people who use their platform. This was very important standing up in the internet because obviously if they could have been held liable, then they would have had to have developed the internet in a much different way. They would have to be very circumspect about who was able to post on their platforms, who would they would even allow to join their platforms, um, and then they may even have to like segregate it off to make sure that um, others couldn't see it so that they could minimize their liability. Instead, because of this provision, they could be much freer in allowing a cross flow of information from whoever joined their platforms and they could not be held liable for that, which also allowed them to get a lot of eyeballs. And because they had a lot of eyeballs, they could sell those to advertisers, making a lot of the content on the internet free. So the reason these were described as um, potentially cases that could undermine the internet is because if you take that whole legal infrastructure out, then it changes the whole way the, the uh, internet is set up and all the platforms are set up and everything else. So the justices became very aware of that when they took this case, they had over 500,000 pages of amicus curiae briefs. Amicus curiae is the um, basically um, front of the court brief. And what they did in those briefings is those companies that submitted those briefs said, look, you can't change the rules now. We've lived under these rules for about 30 plus years. Um, changing them now would be unfair um, and you can't hold us liable when you change the laws at the last second. So the court was very cognizant of that. In fact, one of the justices actually said during the oral argument, she said, obviously you're not looking at the nine most prominent um, 
and most knowledgeable members about the internet. So we're going to be very careful in how we rule to make sure we don't, you know, upset the apple cart here. But they did want to address the legal issues. So I'll address them kind of in reverse order. I'll start with Twitter because that was a more complete decision. What they held, what, what the specific issue in that was, was whether Twitter violated the um, international terrorist criminal provision um, by engaging in an act of international terrorism. And again, what they plaintiffs were arguing was is that they aided and abetted, actively aided and abetted um, the ISIS terrorists in, in doing so, and that they did so via support to um, their training and recruiting programs. But as the facts were revealed in court, Twitter became aware of this, and they actually took fairly active measures to try to re, um, reduce the number of um, people who were using their site who were recruiting for terrorist organizations or were um, trying to um, uh, engage in fundraising, et cetera. So although they, those meaningful and aggressive actions took place, they were deemed by the plaintiff not to be meaningful and aggressive enough. And so they said, because they weren't, they should be held liable. Now, remember under section 230, they can't be held liable for the actual content. They can only be held liable in their own respect. So you can't look at what was said. You can only look at what they did or didn't do as a platform. And in that respect, the court reversed a lower court ruling holding that the case could proceed against them because the court held the mere creation of a social media platform does not make them culpable. Yes, they were alerted by the government that these things were taking place. Yes, they did try to you know, re re reduce those numbers of, of instances. No, they were not completely successful, but when you add all that up, it doesn't meet the criminal standard um, or, the, or the statutory standard rather of meaningful and um, knowing assistance to uh, international terrorism. So the other case, Google versus Gonzalez, excuse me, Gonzalez versus Google, in that case, it was more tightly linked to the actual Section 230 provision. And in this particular case, what the plaintiffs tried to argue is they said, we know we can't look at the actual content that the terrorists or the users provided but well, we can look at what YouTube did. And what they claim YouTube did is that they would prioritize what videos you would see next. So if you asked for a certain type of video, then they would prioritize those. And maybe even when you came back some sometime later, if you asked for different videos, they might throw some of these videos in too because they know you've asked for them in the past. So the question is, is that rank ordering enough? And what came out in the justices questions is, well, was this any different from asking for certain recipes? If you ask you know, how to make certain types of food, wouldn't YouTube provide you recipes on that? And if you, and if you narrowed it down to just you know, rice pilaf recipes, wouldn't they narrow it just to that? So was YouTube doing anything different with regard to these terrorist videos? And it came out that no, they weren't. They were just using what you asked for to give you what they thought would best meet that criteria. And in some cases, it's difficult for the platform to determine whether a, a terrorist video is one that's actually supporting terrorism or showing why it's bad or showing how you can you know, avoid um, you know, getting these types of links or all sorts of other things. It's somewhat difficult for them to ferret all that out. Um, and furthermore, the plaintiff said, well, they also took kind of a thumbnail and they made a thumbnail so that you would kind of see what the video was about. And that thumbnail was not created by the um, terrorist. That was actually created by YouTube. So they said that was their independent creation, not you know, the, the user's creation. But the court said, really, in most cases, those thumbnails are just really kind of freeze frames of part of the video. So it's not really an independent creation. So in the end, they vacated the lower court's decision and remanded it in light of their Twitter finding. So basically, they've punted on both of these cases. There are a couple more cases that raise the issue of Section 230 more cleanly. We'll see if the court takes this up in the future, and we'll see how they deal with that. Um, okay, we have a question. Let's see. Is the Privacy Act expected to be revised? Okay. Um, okay, let me put off on that question because it doesn't directly relate to the slide, but I can try. To, if I can't answer your question in this specific session, I can try to see if I can um, collect the questions and, and answer you privately later. Um, so let me move on to the FISA. FISA is Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Um, Section 702 of that act is set to expire at the end of this year. Um, what Section 702 does is it provides a special 
exigent circumstances exception, meaning that the government doesn't actually have to seek a FISA warrant as long as they get the approval of both the Attorney General and the Director of National Intelligence, which is, you know, very high level approval, um, not often given. Um, when they get that approval, then they are allowed to engage in surveillance against persons who are located outside the United States and not believed to be U.S. persons. Now, I guess the controversy in this comes up where people from the United States call a foreign national because they are then able to surveil that conversation and obviously they get both sides of the conversation. Um, generally, they tend to minimize those and they try to um, only use the foreign, foreign part of it um, for the purposes that they're you know, obtaining this, but there have been some rare situations where the information, because it is in the database, can potentially be used for other purposes, and this is what has made it somewhat controversial. The current administration has strongly supported this, as has the Department of Defense, um, and they have held basically that it has really helped in the past, including in some foreign ransomware attacks, in even some Al Qaeda al threats, um, and in other weapons of mass destruction issues, and even some attempts to recruit spies. So this will be interesting to see whether this actually gets updated or not. As so many of the provisions of the FISA, some are set to expire after a certain number of years. This is one of those. Um, and anytime they come up for reauthorization, it does become a little bit of a, a quandary whether they will actually be approved again or in some modified form. Um, we'll have to see on that. In the past, it usually has come down to the very last minute and then they usually approve it. But um, there is a little bit more pushback this year than previously. Um, how does FISA interact with GDPR from the EU? It's a very good question because actually a case that I'm going to be addressing later in this um, series today um, will show how a recent FISA, site, FISA decision actually kind of hurt the United States um, interpretation and uh, enforcement of GDPR. So yes, it does play into it directly. Um, in fact, um, one of the revelations about the scope of FISA is actually what kind of prompted um, the EU um, to, to basically require more protections within the United States um, and undermine some of that free flow of data. And that's still in contest right now because of some recent cases that have um, it invalidated some of the provisions under which the United States used to share data with the EU. So those are still a little bit up in the air. Um, there is a, a prototype agreement. The United States is prepared to move forward. But as I said, one of these Supreme Court cases came down around that same time, which may actually undermine that. The next thing I'd like to talk about is a bill that is being proposed for passage. Um, it's called the Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act, also called FAMFSA. Obviously, the, uh, the uh, uh, staffers who are working for this particular group of congressmen are not earning their pay. You're normally supposed to come up with a, an acronym that's easily pronounceable. FAMFSA is not really that well pronounceable. So in any event, it was introduced in the last Congress, and basically um, it just recently got reintroduced, and it seems to be making some big headway. And there are now some congressmen and senators who are proposing to include it in the must-pass um, uh, not National Defense Authorization Act, and if it gets included in there, it probably will become law. Um, whether it will or not, unclear, but the fact that they're talking about it already um, is, an, is a strong indication, and the fact that it has bipartisan support also gives additional weight to the potential that it may um, pass. Briefly, what it says is that um, they have noticed that law enforcement and intelligence agencies from the government um, have been buying data instead of getting a Fourth Amendment search warrant for it. So this can occur because currently the United States does not have strong privacy protections and does not limit the bulk um, selling of private data in any, in any federal way. And so what that results in is these bulk um, data providers who are selling a lot of information that is very valuable um, to advertisers, but also in some cases, if the government doesn't believe that they could easily get a Fourth Amendment search warrant for the data, they can just buy it. So what this has kind of um, caused concern about is that obviously we don't want constitutional protections to be um, easily circumvented by just purchasing the data. It does set up kind of a weird situation though, where if this bill passes, then all of our adversaries, um, criminals, anybody else who wants the data could get it just by buying it. 
but the United States government could not. Um, so that would be a little bit of a strange situation, but um, we do have that in some other areas as well. So we'll see again how, how this um, goes as well. Okay, and then the national cybersecurity strategy, I don't really have a lot of time to get into that um, today. I will just say that it shifted the focus more from cyber, which is a much broader concept, down to cybersecurity. And perhaps most importantly, it's also trying to rebalance the cybersecurity burden. So it traditionally has been on the end users. Now what they're trying to say is, hey, we should be able to hold um, software providers and vendors liable if they're selling us bad software because the, the they have more um, money, more uh, influence over how the software works and functions than the end user, and we shouldn't be putting all the burden on the end user. Um, I should say also the National Cybersecurity Strategy Implementation Plan was just issued um, just days ago, so that will provide specific measures and um, metrics to determine how well we're implementing this, and I encourage you to download that from the web um, because it's, it has a very important role. It also does mention the DOD cyber strategy. DOD did not narrow theirs. Theirs is still a broad cyber strategy, and that's also downloadable from the web. Both of those documents are also available on our DOD cybersecurity policy chart. Okay, now I'd like to get into some actual cases where I kind of make it a little bit more interactive. What I'm gonna get into first are some reverse warrant cases. A reverse warrant kind of turns the table. Normally in a warrant, you believe you know who the criminal is or you believe you know where the evidence is and say so you describe with particularity where it's likely to be found and a judge determines whether you've met the probable cause standard and you get it. In a reverse warrant, you're basically saying, I don't know where it is and I don't know who did it, but if you give me a bunch of data that has been otherwise collected in certain types of ways, I might be able to narrow down the scope of who might have done it and that might help me identify them. So these are somewhat controversial, but there's been some recent cases that I think should be helpful. Then we're going to do a little bit of privacy, biometrics, some evidence preservation, and, and on. I will say I have way more cases than I can deal with in this one hour block. So don't despair. I will make the slides available right after this presentation and you can review them at your leisure. Um, I would rather go through them you know, sufficiently so that I can actually um, and kind of address this. Okay, it looks like we have another question. How is bad software defined? Um, is fit for purpose to find. Okay, yeah, this is a tricky situation, um, but I think in some cases where the software specifically has backdoors that reasonable per people believe should not have been left in the software and create um, avenues for adversaries to exploit, I think in some of those cases they could define that as defective software. Um, whether it's fit for purpose, you know, some states have different ways that they define that as well, and that may raise different issues, um, but both of those are not firmly established yet. And, you know, with regard to some of the issues that Microsoft itself has recently faced, where uh, one of their um, signing tokens was stolen, and that allowed some, some adversaries to pose as, as uh, or pose some of their software as signed by Microsoft, um, and some other issues there have been some calls within Congress to hold them liable under these particular provisions. Obviously, Microsoft is pushing back hard, and, and I've just given them as one example. There have been similar cases with um, other major vendors. So these are going to be hard fought. The vendors don't want to be held liable, obviously, but I think the more we can push against them and make sure that they um, take reasonable precautions, there's no way we can make the software perfect. We understand that, but reasonable precautions um, that probably will go a lot further towards limiting the amount of liability that those vendors will have to face. Okay, so first case, United States versus Rhine. This does revolve around the January 6th riots. So as everyone certainly knows, um, on January 6th, um, a couple of years ago, um, there was a, a riot at the Capitol in which thousands of people descended upon the Capitol, creating um, a very dangerous situation for the Capitol Police, um, causing quite a bit of damage at the Capitol, et cetera. But because there were so many people and it was um, not, um, you know, a lot of witnesses who came forward um, with regard to who those people were, um, it was difficult for the law enforcement personnel to immediately determine how to start prosecuting these people. So what they did is they served a geofence warrant on Google. Now, almost all geofence warrants are served on Google. A geofence warrant is a warrant 
that basically says, I want to know all people who were within a certain defined area. And the reason Google gets pinged with these warrants is because Google has a, a capability called location history, which if you're carrying any Android device or if you're using any Google apps on another device, such as Maps, um, Gmail, et cetera, there's a good chance that you have opted in, whether you perhaps potentially didn't realize it or not, to Google's location history collection. Um, you can opt out. You can go to Google and say, I want out. You can even say, I want my prior history to be removed. It may create some problems if you use maps to go home or to your work every day. If you opt out, it will remove a lot of that information. So you won't be able to just say go home or, or whatever else because that data won't be there. Um, so it can create some inconveniences that some people don't like, but it is possible to opt out of it. In any event, what Google has done is they've said, okay, look, we're gonna treat these requests for data as requiring a warrant. There's nothing clear yet in the law whether they even require a warrant or not, but Google said they will demand a warrant. So law enforcement agencies have been complying with that. And usually the way they serve this warrant is via a three-step process. The first one is give us everyone in an anonymized way who is within the bounded area. Then secondly, we'll exclude some based on other factors, like if they were just moving quickly through the area, um, you know, especially if you're trying to do a robbery, you know, suspect list, if they moved quickly through the area, then they wouldn't have had time to actually rob the bank. So even though they may have been in that location, they, they didn't, you know, they weren't uh, an actual suspect. Um, so they do this down selection, and then usually they have a third down selection where they actually say, okay, now, based on all the data that we have, we want just the names and um, contact information for these specific in individuals. So that's usually that three-step process that they engage in. And the three-step process has to be fairly objective because if it's just, um, if it's too subjective, the courts will tend to um, actually rule against it. So in this case, um, you can see in that little image at the bottom, the, the bright green it kind of was the bounds that they set up for Google. And as you can see, it very tightly circumscribed the capital region, you know, and not, not region, the capital building itself um, with just a little bit of maybe grass area on, on the sides, but you know, it's very, very tight. So that's a first thing. And that's one thing that courts will look more favorably upon. If you do a large area that lots of people are likely to go through like a, a highway off ramp or a, a large office building with multiple floors. If you do something like that, the courts are going to be a little bit more reluctant to give that because there's too much chance that lots of innocent people will be in there. So after they got about 5,700 accounts that way, then they said, okay, we want to exclude people who either came right before then and left right after that or you know, just passed through. And I believe they also had a list of people who worked in the Capitol. And so all those people were removed as well. So once they got down to all that, they got down to about 1,498. At that point, Google said, oh yeah, by the way, we just thought you would want to know, there were 70 people that asked that their location history for January 6th be deleted. Did you want them as well? And so the, the law enforcement agency said, yes, of course, yeah, please throw those in. And they ran a similar you know, exclusion list on them. And so they ended up taking 37 of those. So I say that by way of even if you have your location history deleted, if you do it right after a crime, Google will probably still have it and they still will be able to provide it to law enforcement. So that's just something to keep in mind. Not that any of you are going to do this, but <laughs> later um, when the warrant was served, um, they identified uh, this um, defendant, Ryan. And so he actually moved to suppress the data under the Fourth Amendment. So the issue is, does obtaining Google location history data under a geofence warrant violate the Constitution as a general warrant. Um, go ahead and raise your hand if you think it does violate a general warrant. Okay, and I should say a general warrant is a warrant where the government just comes in and says, I have the right to get this and just give it to me and they don't have to provide any real rationale. Whereas a, a traditional warrant, you say, I think I know who did it or I think, you know, I have probable cause to believe I'm going to find useful data or useful evidence at this location. Okay, lower your hands. And now those who think it is not a general warrant. Raise your hands. Okay. 
So we have a pretty good split. Um, and so basically what the court held in this case is no. Um, it did not constitute a, vi a general warrant. It was not a violation under, of the Constitution because they met the particularized probable cause standard. So the United States actually made two arguments. They said, first, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy in your location history in the Capitol at that time because it's a public building and they were engaged in a very, you know, this was when they were actually doing the validation of the electors. So they were saying you had no reasonable expectation of privacy in there. The court actually declined to rule on that issue because they actually ruled on this on the government's US government's second holding, and that is that the warrant satisfied the Fourth Amendment. And they said that it did satisfy it because they went through this three step process where they did kind of ferret out any of the accounts that they did not believe were likely to be um, suspect in this in this case. So the defendant replied that it was over breath that Google searched millions of innocent records, um, which is true. In fact, it's probably closer to billions because they usually have to go through their whole location history database, which includes just basically tons of people's location history everywhere. Um, and they have to narrow it down just to the ones in this particular area. So they do go through millions, if not billions of innocent records, but the court held that's not really um, you know, significant because one, the Fourth Amendment only prohibits Fourth Amendment pr protected conduct, which is against the government. So the government didn't actually conduct this search. It was Google. And furthermore, Google didn't actually have people looking at all these records. Google just had a machine pull them out for them. So it's not like all these innocent people had their privacy you know, revealed to anyone at that time. In fact, most of the millions, billions of people would never even have made through the first you know, uh, sift. So they would not have ever had anything exposed um, except to the Google internal database um, processes. Then they said Google shouldn't have provided the records prior to deletion. Um, that was a little bit more questionable, but the court held that no, that was fine. And then the control lists they said were a violation, but actually the court noted that the control lists were actually um, minimizing the de-anonymization. So they, the control list actually helped rather than hurt the case, they actually helped because it further removed people who should not be part of the, um, the suspect list. So the takeaway on this is that geofence warrant law is still pretty scarce. Um, it has gone both ways, but generally when there's a three-step approach, as in this case, and where there's objective criteria and where the geofence is narrowly drawn, it will generally be upheld. Any questions on that? I don't see any in the, let me just make sure. Okay. Okay. Oh, I see a follow-up to the other one. If factor was defined in the spec, does that mean it works as intended? Um, yeah, that's, that's always going to be the tricky part, and this goes back to the previous slide. But um, if software um, is defined in a way, um, some people are going to try to claim, well, we, we specifically defined it that way, and that's how you get it. And I think there's also going to be the risk that when vendors sell the, the software, they're going to say, you take this knowing it may have defects and you accept them and you agree not to sue us and everything else. So they're going to have to work around all those issues because uh, those are potential issues. But I don't see any questions on this case. So let's move along. The next one is the keyword warrants. Um, and this is Colorado versus Seymour. This is a sad case in which some arsonists set fire to a house in Colorado. They killed a Senegalese family of five that ranged in age from two months, a two month old baby to a 29 year old. Um, the police had no leads whatsoever. They had no clue why someone would have targeted this family and why they would have burned their house down. Um, so they employed a variety of techniques, including cell site simulators, also called stingrays. These are devices that law enforcement sometimes will set up in particular areas. It acts like it's a cell tower and basically your phone will connect to it because it's the closest one and it allows law enforcement to see who you are and you know what you're connecting to and, and things like that. So um, they tried those, they tried tower dumps. Tower dumps are where you take every cell phone that connect to a particular tower to try to figure out where people might have been at certain times based on whether, you know, which towers they were pinging off of. Geofence warrants, we just went through that. And they also purchased data from data brokers, which we addressed in the FANSPA Act. <laughs> um, so they tried pretty much everything but the last thing they tried is this keyword search warrant. So what they did is they asked Google for the IP addresses of anyone who searched 
for this house address within 15 days prior to it being burned. And they got back, you know, quite a few pings, but not that many. And several of them were for this address in other states. So they immediately threw those out. So when they actually got down to the ones who searched for this specific address in Colorado within this 15-day period, it actually identified three people. Seymour, who's the defendant in this case, and two other teens. After they ended up doing a lot of research, they found out that the reason they had burned this house is because one of them lost their phone. They did a find my phone on their phone, and apparently they thought that the phone was identifying um, their house as the site where the phone was currently. It turns out they had misread the map, and so that was actually not the house where the, the stolen phone was, but they burned it down because they did not realize that. So very, very sad. In any event, now that they're, they're facing criminal charges, the question came up, um, does obtaining IP addresses associated with keyword searches that you put into your browser in a web search, does that violate the Fourth Amendment as a general warrant, or in this case, or it's Colorado equivalent? So again, how many people think it does violate the general warrant? Raise your hand. Okay. Very good. Okay, you can put your hands down now. And then how many think it does not violate the general warrant? Okay. It looks like a lot more think it does not, but we still have a pretty good um, mix. So basically here the court held no, it does not. They said the warrant was specific and procedurally sound um, and it was supported. Now, again, what they're claiming in this case is that, well, yeah, but they had to go through billions of Google's records. Think of all the searches that are submitted to Google every day, and they had to go through all those to figure out who might have put these specific keywords in within a 15-day period of time. So the court, again, said, though, you know, searching through all these things is not a Fourth Amendment issue because it's not the government that's doing the search. It's Google. Google's a private party. They're not bound by the Fourth Amendment. And secondly, uh, it's all being done by machines, so it's not like people are actually seeing these records. The only ones that are actually being seen are the ones that come out of the search, which is a very small number. Um, the, the complicating issue in this particular case, though, was a, a, another case in Colorado, and it's somewhat specific to Colorado, so I'll go through it kind of fast because it's not going to apply in many other states, but it's this Tattered Cover case. Tattered Cover is a very famous bookstore in Denver. And they were asked in one case to provide um, the names of anyone who bought books on drug making um, because police found a meth lab with drug making books that had been mailed to the suspect from Tattered Cover. And so they wanted to know who was the person that was ordering these books um, so that they could basically prosecute them for that. Tattered Cover refused to give up a list of who ordered books from them. And in that particular case, the court held that there is a higher standard for warrants that seek First Amendment protected material like um, acquisition of books. So the question was, in this case, does the search that's submitted in a Google web browser, which is potentially also seeking First Amendment material, although in this case it was only seeking the address of a, a family, um, does that also raise this elevated standard? So that is being argued on appeal. It was actually argued May 4th um, of this year. I did check to see if the Colorado Supreme Court um, turned around a quick order, but I did not see anything come out yet. It will likely take some time because this is a fairly complex case that is setting new precedent in this area. So the takeaway is that keyword search warrant cases are almost non-existent. This is one of the few I could find. So it will still be a developing area of law but one that is increasingly relied upon by law enforcement because it provides such good um, inputs into who might have done something like this. You'd be amazed at how many times, um, you know, in one case, an individual called distraught, said his wife was gone. He didn't know what happened to her. Um, they eventually found her at the bottom of a lake some distance from his house. Um, they didn't have any immediate um, suspects, but frequently in these types of cases, it is someone who's known by the victim. So they did a Google I, uh, keyword search on the husband's computer to see what he was searching for. And lo and behold, he'd search for how to kill someone in ways that are not identifiable. Um, one of the ways suggested was um, strangling them and then jumping them in a, a lake. 
And then his next search was, um, what is the closest lake to me that's super deep? And they gave this particular lake's address. So, um, you know, it was very damning evidence against this particular individual. And you'd be surprised how often that happens. So I think that this particular investigative technique will become more and more widely employed. And so we will likely get more and more case law on it. But right now we have this one case which they upheld it. And so we'll see where that goes. The next case um, deals with something that you might deal with if you are in any type of a uh, um, system provider role or system administrator role. Um, and so I thought it might be interesting, especially if you work it within the government. In this particular case, um, the Taylor County Sheriff's or Organization was contacted by a TV show called, called Cold Justice, and they were asked if they would share a cold murder case, and they did. We'll call that murder case one. And apparently it was very successful. And so um, the the network called back to the department, uh, the sheriff's department, and asked if they could obtain additional murder cases. And Detective Bowers happened to answer the phone, and he personally agreed that they could, even though he did not clear this with the Taylor County Sheriff's Department. And so he sent them two more murder cases via a personal Dropbox account. But he had established this personal Dropbox account using his county email address. So when Taylor County found out about this, they contacted Dropbox and said, we want to find out what Detective Bauer sent and what he said in his, his um, Dropbox account regarding these cases. So please give us all the contents of his Dropbox account. And Dropbox said, no, it's not your account, it's his account you have to get his permission or you have to get him to consent to it. Instead, what they did is they said, well, if he used a county email address, why don't we just try to access his account? We'll pretend that we forgot the email, uh, the password rather, and then they will send us a password reset to the county address. And because we work for the county and we have authority over county email addresses, we'll just reset the password, then we'll go in and we'll get all the data. So they did that. And after they got all the data, they used that to prosecute him for this particular situation. So the question that's raised on appeal is, should Bauer's um, motion to suppress the files um, in his Dropbox account prevail? So how many think Byers prevails in suppressing the files? Raise your hand. OK. And go ahead and lower your hands now. And how many think the county prevails because of the fact that it was a county account? Okay, well, we're getting a lot of good feedback and it's pretty much evenly split. <laughs> so this is a good, good case, obviously. So the court held the county's access violated Bauer's Fourth Amendment rights. And the reason is this. Although Bowers used a county email address, he did not do so from his county, um, or, or he did not use a county um, device um, for storing this information. He used this commercial account, this commercial Dropbox. And so the county, even though they tried to claim, well, he agreed that he had no expectation of privacy for any material on Taylor County equipment, well, this wasn't on that equipment. And then, you know, even if the material was generated for his personal use. So when they tried to use that against him, that doesn't really help. Now, obviously, if he had downloaded this Dropbox account data onto his government machine, then the county could have gotten anything that was on his county machine, and they could have gotten anything that was in his county um, email address if he'd somehow send it back to himself. But they can't get it in his commercial Dropbox account, even if he happened to use a county email address to set it up. Okay. So now I will tell you, using a government email address to set up any commercial account, very bad practice. Do not do it, okay? Very bad. But if you happen to have done it, it does not thereby give the government the right to violate your Fourth Amendment rights by going in and posing as you in order to reset your password. So do not, if you are a government service provider, do not try this. It will not work, as you see in this case. Um, and so let's just kind of go through the court's analysis. Whenever you do a Fourth Amendment test, there's usually two tests. One is the subjective expectation 
Um, did the did Bowers in this case reasonably believe he had an expectation of privacy? And he said he did, and the county did not contest it. So then the only other part of the test is the objective expectation. Was it reasonable for him to expect that this data would be private um, based on where he stored it? And the court said yes, that he stored it in a Dropbox account that was private and that he had password protection assigned to it. Obviously, password protection is not the best, but it does indicate some um, effort not to use the information against him. Okay, so I see a question, couldn't they use the Freedom of Information Act to access Dropbox? Okay, no, um, good question, but the Freedom of Information Act only applies to the government. So um, people can ask the government for information that's held by the government, and if it falls under one of the multiple exceptions of the Freedom of Information Act, then they may be able to get it. But the Freedom of Information Act cannot be used against private providers like Dropbox or Google or anyone else like that. What if a work user agreement for the sheriff states that you can't move county info off the county network? Does that allow county access to the info that was moved without county's consent? No. Um, he can certainly be prosecuted still for moving the county information off the network, but that doesn't give them the right to access it um, just because he did. Let's suppose, you know, instead of putting it in a Dropbox, let's just suppose he physically carried the data out to his home. Do you think that the county should be able to just come out to his home and start looking through his home for this data because they say, well, you illegally removed it? No, they would have to get a search warrant. And that's what the court is saying here. If you have probable cause to believe it, get the search warrant, serve it on Dropbox, or get the, the, the person to consent to it if they're willing to do that, but don't just go through the back door as they did in this case by resetting the password um, using his county email address to do that. Okay, so um, some people have asked whether the third party exception would apply in this case. The third party exception is that generally if you give something to another person, you, you kind of lose an expectation of privacy in that. So for instance, if I owned a book, like a diary, and I gave it to a friend and I said, hey, here, hold my diary for me and, and don't show it to anybody else. If that person chose to look inside it and they saw something that might have raised some criminal you know, suspicions, they could turn it into the government and I could not complain under the Fourth Amendment because under the third party exception, I gave it to them. Um, there is some concern now because uh, the, if you apply that third party exception broadly, I mean, today because of um, cloud providers, um, we are giving away data to third parties almost all the time. So we give data to our you know, Google Mail, to Outlook, to Microsoft Cloud, to Dropbox, to all sorts of other entities. And so far the courts have held that that does not reasonably fit under the third party exception. Um, perhaps the most significant case was the first one I list there, Carpenter. In that case, people were using cell phones and the county, or excuse me, the government, the federal government in that case, um, used a warrant. No, sorry, take that back. They did not use a warrant. They said, we wanna just get the information on which cell towers your phone was pinging off of because it's being held by the phone provider and you have no expectation of privacy in that because you gave that information to them. Now, I question how many people knowingly realize that just by carrying a phone around that they have consented to letting it ping off every tower and, and consenting to the phone company to give that information away. But even if they did, what the court held is that it's not reasonable in our modern society because people carry cell phones all around with them all the time and they can't be expected to turn those off constantly so that they don't have to reveal their location all the time. Um, and it would make it too easy for government to find out where you had been in all you know, situations because they could just always go back to the government, and, excuse me, to the phone company and ask for that data. So the court in, no, in that case held, it's not that the government can't get it, they just have to use a warrant to get it. They can't rely on the third party exception. And that's what courts are increasingly doing. As the technology improves, the courts are trying to reassess the balance to make sure that we still have some privacy protection under the Fourth Amendment that's somewhat similar to the way we used to have it before all this technology was entered into our lives and started kind of eating it away. What happens in the future if AI tool detects that a information belonging to a government is being stored in a public storage? Can county access that info and Dropbox to inform the, the owner? 
Okay. Um, I mean, I guess it depends. As I currently understand it, these AI tools, although they scrape information from everywhere, um, it's not that easy to find out where they scraped it from. So even if you found out through an AI tool that, you know, somehow they found this information from a government uh, murder case, you know, through this AI, so it must have scraped it from somewhere, it's not clear to me that under the current ways that AI tools are developed, you would be able to figure out where that was. And even if you did, even if somehow you were able to find out that they'd scraped Dropbox, which would be very surprising, um, it seems to me, based on the holding of this court, that you would still have to get a search warrant against Dropbox to get it, because that still doesn't, just because you know where it probably is, that just may help you draft your search warrant better. It doesn't give you the right to just um, go in through the back door and change the um, password. Okay, here's the case that someone asked about earlier, and that is, you know, how does FISA impact the GDPR? So in this particular case, FBI versus Fazaga, the FBI used a confidential informant for about 14 months um, to basically infiltrate the Islamic Center of Irvine, California. And he went in wearing um, and planting recording devices to determine if there was any uh, violent activity being planned. He even suggested some violent actions himself. When he started making these, these suggestions, the um, Islamic Center of Irvine actually kicked him out of their, their center. Um, but during that time, they found out that he had collected a lot of information against a lot of people in their center, which they found to be a violation of the Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, and, and uh, First Amendment even. So they actually sued um, the government, the FBI, claiming that doing this was a violation of all these particular provisions. They're suing in a criminal, excuse me, in a civil case for damages and for an injunction, I believe, so that the FBI could not do this in the future. In this case, the United States Attorney General asserted the state secrets privilege. The state secret privilege says that if a, in a civil case, the evidence that is being sought by the plaintiff would reveal state secrets that are too sensitive to be known publicly, that the United States Attorney can just assert that and then the judge has to decide what happens to the case if that evidence is kept out. In this case, the district court judge determined if that evidence is kept out, then all the claims would have to be dismissed because the plaintiff would no longer be able to prove their claims. Um, the Ninth Circuit reversed it saying, no, the, the class action can proceed. Then the FBI appealed to the Supreme Court. So the question is, does, um, does the FISA, this particular section of FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, does that displace the state, state secrets privilege? FISA actually determined under what circumstances the foreign intelligence um, agencies can seek warrants. Um, did that displace the state secrets privilege by resolving those issues? How many think it that FISA did displace the state secrets privilege? Raise your hand. Okay, and how many think, okay, go ahead and lower your hands. And how many think it did not? Okay. Okay, some of you aren't voting anymore. You must have got enough wrong that you're now fearful. <laughs> but uh, again, we have a pretty good split there. So this is another interesting case. In this particular case, the Supreme Court held nine to zero, which they hardly ever do nowadays, <laughs> that it did not displace the state secrets footage. And the reason they said it did not is that the the state secrets privilege was known at common law. It's been in existence for a very long time, um, but it was not even mentioned in any respect in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And generally, if you are not going to even mention it, um, then there's a, some kind of presumption that it probably doesn't affect it. Because uh, if you meant to affect it, you probably should have specifically mentioned it. So um, now the reason this hurts the U.S agreement to share data with the EU under the GDPR is that Privacy, Privacy Shield 2 um, and some of the earlier variations tried to claim that EU citizens could, you know, basically assert their rights if they believe their private information was being misused. But the Supreme Court's decision in this case says that even if you could prove that you may be barred if the United States asserts the state secrets privilege. 
So this kind of undermines things um, for the United States going forward. We'll have to see how this goes. Um, as I said, there is an agreement in principle for a follow-on agreement between the EU and the US. Um, it was announced right around the same time that this decision came out. So it's not clear that it took into account this decision. So we'll have to see how that goes. Um, I see a rough road ahead um, for the EU and the US in coming up with a new agreement that meets all parties. Um, now, I should say in passing that this is a tricky one because the GDPR does not actually apply to intelligence units within the EU. So they're kind of holding the United States to a much higher standard, but um, that's a tricky situation that we can't seem to get around right now. The last case I'll bring up is this particular case. I think it's kind of a fun one. A particular individual um, said that he found about 20 child porn images on a tablet that someone had loaned to him. Um, the agents went out and arrested the individual who owned the tablet and they realized that it was locked. So what they did is they basically um, said um, they, they got his phone and they basically put the phone up to his face and said, is this your phone? And because he had facial ID um, autom you know, on, it opened the phone and they were then able to get into the phone contents. So the question is, did this warrantless, non-consensual use of his biometric information by flashing the phone in front of his face violate the Fourth or Fifth Amendment? And if so, does it justify the suppression of the tablets? So how many think that this warrantless search, which is basically putting the phone in front of his face to open it, how many of you think that's a violation of the Fourth Amendment or the Fifth Amendment? Raise your hand. Okay, lots of people from that one. Okay, lower your hands. And how many think it does not? Okay, smaller number. Now, if it does, can you lower hands? If it does violate his Fourth Amendment, does that justify the suppression of the data on the tablet? How many think it does? Okay, lower hands. And how many think it does not? Okay, also a big split here. So just real quickly, the court held that it was testimonial. Um, I think this is an outlier. I don't think that many courts would do this. Generally, um, your facial identification, your fingerprints, et cetera, are considered to be things that you don't have an expectation of privacy in because you expose them to the public all the time. Nevertheless, the court did hold that it was, but they also held that unlocking the phone, even though it equated to testimony, um, it did not impact directly the, tab the, the contents of the tablet, which is a different device. Um, now, I don't know whether they used the data in the phone to open up the tablet or not. That might have been um, a fruit of the poisonous tree issue, but it doesn't appear that that was an issue in this particular case. Um, now, I will say, what would we do if instead of, you know, flashing the phone in front of your face, they instead you know, you're, you're kind of a well-known person, they just pulled an image for, from you, or they just pulled your image off of Facebook or LinkedIn or something like that and use that. You know, true, iPhones now require 3D image, but it's not that hard with AI and, and other tools now to convert a 2D image into a 3D image. If they did that, would that also be a Fourth Amendment violation just because they took your face from a public website um, and made it into something that could open your phone? Lots of questions here. We unfortunately don't have time to answer them all. So I'm going to have to end it here, but thank you very much for your participation, and the slides will be available after this presentation. Back to you. All right. Thanks, Rick. No, I appreciate that, and thanks for sticking to the time and honoring the, the hour that we had here. Um, thanks, everybody, for attending. As Rick said, the video will be available. We'll post that um, on our website and also on our YouTube channel. And um, if there are any follow-up questions for Rick or for CSI that we can help answer, I would encourage you to take advantage of the technical inquiry service that we have with CSI where we will um, answer any technical questions you might have um, in support of your government related efforts. Uh, so again, thank you all and uh, appreciate your time. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Rick. Thank you.